I feel very privileged today to be able to talk to you about one such issue, what I consider to be our most prevalent yet most curable social disease in our country and in our world today, domestic violence. What begins in homes and in relationships and spreads to the streets, to our schools, our places of work, and across our planet. My goal today is to connect those dots and to talk about those connections, how they impact all of us now more than ever during these turbulent economic times, and also to discuss how we can all play important transformational roles in breaking the chain of violence. First, though, before I continue, I do need to clear something up. I'm not a woman. Yo soy una mujer. Now, that may be stating the obvious, but even after nine years of speaking out against domestic violence, I'm still often asked, yeah, but isn't that strictly a woman's issue? That seems to be a popular misconception, because as far as I'm concerned, domestic violence needs to be everyone's issue. No, I'm not a woman, and for the many men involved in this cause, I don't think our caring about this issue makes us women. And no, I'm uh, not a girl man, <laughs> which is something the governor of California likes to say a lot, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> you know, it really concerns me when our public debate about leadership boils down to quien es más macho. Who's more manly? Leadership isn't about posturing and swagger, and true machismo isn't about proving dominance and superiority. A true macho, a real manly man, is a man who joins in the movement to end violence against women and children, or anyone, and those who champion the protection, empowerment, and the health of all citizens. Now, I happen to know a little bit about misconceptions. I was born in Cuba, but I lived in this country most of my life, and it amazes me that there are those who want to label and then pigeonhole certain sectors of society. One of the reasons that I became an actor was so I could play a wide spectrum of different characters, both good and evil. And even though I'm very proud of my Latino heritage, I wanted to portray people from different walks of life other than my own. And as a matter of fact, when I was getting started as an actor, I changed my last name from Rivas to Rivers. So you're probably wondering how this turned out. Let's see, so far I've mostly played uh, Latino drug dealers, <laughs> Latino bank robbers, Latino convicts. Oh, here's a stretch, I was Zorro's brother. <laughs> now, I put a lot of violent individuals on screen, but because in Hollywood, good usually triumphs over evil, they almost always have to kill me off. Very creatively, I might add. Of course, the beauty of what we do in the movies is that it's make-believe. We have a script to follow and the director to gauge the action and even the violence and the yell, cut, when it's over. But to the victims and survivors of domestic violence, family violence, and child abuse, it's not make-believe. That violence, it's real, it's terrifying, it's scarring, and sometimes it's deadly. All too often, there's no one there to yell, cut, or cut it out, before it's too late. So uh, what's the movie bad guy doing talking about family violence? Why do I believe in the power of this forum so that more of us can break the silence on domestic violence? Why do I believe that our current economic and other crises make the work of violence intervention and prevention the more urgent? Well, for one reason, it's because of a woman I know. This woman had come from another country with her husband and two young sons, like so many other immigrant families, to pursue a better way of life here in America only to find herself and her children terrorized by the oppression of domestic violence and child abuse that took place on a level of torture in their home. For 15 years after giving birth to three more children and carrying the burden of cooking, cleaning, child care, and a full-time job at a factory, this woman also had to endure the physical, psychological, and emotional woundings at the hands of her husband until one day when she set off on foot to the local laundromat, pulling her family's many loads of laundry behind her in a cart well, that woman didn't make it home that day. On the way there, she collapsed in the street and was rushed to a hospital where doctors determined that she was so close to death, they told her she was in God's hands. Because of repeated beatings with a steel-handled hairbrush to her chest, she had developed a form of pleurisy, a swelling of the lining of the heart. Now, this woman remained in that hospital for two weeks as a Jane Doe because she was too frightened to give her real name for fear of the punishment that she would receive if she did live. Fortunately, this woman survived her collapse, but upon returning to the household, the domestic violence only increased. I also speak out because of a boy I know. This boy walked into his city's police department, and he took out all his clothes in front of a room full of police officers. And as that boy stood there naked, the officers were horrified that this boy's body was covered in bruises, welts, and burns. 
The boy told the police, my father's doing this to me, to my siblings, and to my mom. And then he pleaded with him. He said, please go to my house and get him out of it for good. Arrest him. What the police said they could do was to have the boy sign a formal complaint. They would put him in the car, drive him back to the house, and they would talk to the father. The boy said, you don't seem to understand. If I do that and you don't arrest him, he's going to kill me when you leave. They said there was nothing more that they could do, that it was a private family matter. Well, that year was 1967, and that boy I'm talking about was me. And that woman who collapsed on the street, that was my mother. That nightmare was life for me, for my siblings, and for my mom. Now, to the outside world, we appear no different than any other immigrant family trying to make it in this country. Certainly, my father appeared absolutely normal. He had a great command of English from his schooling in Cuba. He was friendly, handsome, a real charming guy. But inside our house, behind closed doors, lived a much different person. I don't remember my father ever hugging or kissing my mother. My mother was forbidden to hug or kiss her sons because it might turn us into sissies. So my father said, 